So, you know, recently I made it through 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles before I jumped over to the New Testament. And that's a, it's a journey through the Old Testament. To, you kind of have to do them all together, the, the themes, the storylines, they all, they all are similar. And, and there's somebody that I really love in, in the, the storyline, and that's Hezekiah. And actually, after David and Solomon, more material is committed to Hezekiah than any other king. Okay, so he's kind of a formidable individual. His story takes place around 700 B.C. And, and what's powerful about Hezekiah is um, he turns to the Lord whenever he has a problem. Okay, just a great role model for all of us. He has a big problem. The Assyrians, who are rolling across the globe and considered to be one of the three worst people of all time, okay, they're coming to Jerusalem to take away um, the people of God. And they would show up and say, listen, you want to make it easy or do you want to make it hard? If you make it easy, you know, we'll be uh, a little less brutal with you. Um, and so that wasn't a very enticing invite. And so um, what Hezekiah does is he gets the letter from the Assyrian general and he immediately runs to the sanctuary, lays it out on the altar and gets on his knees before the Lord. So you might not have Assyrians coming after you, but I'm guessing that sometimes you have problems, issues, stuff that's going on. I'm going to suggest you do what Hezekiah did. You take it into the sanctuary, lay it before the Lord, get on your knees and say, God, here's my problem. Help me. Okay. And, and he prays. And, and, and what's kind of fun is, is he points out that these people are speaking against you, God. He takes his problem and makes it God's problem. And so... Very smart move. Remember what we read in Exodus 14? The Lord will fight for you. Okay? So we have an opportunity here to put into motion. Um, you know, Hezekiah says everybody else's gods have been destroyed, but they're not real gods. You are a real God. He's speaking against you. He's threatening you. And he asks, Lord, deliver us from the Assyrians' hands so all the kingdoms on earth may know that you alone are God. Now realize, what's his focus? The greatness of God being promoted. The glory of God being revealed. And so we got a couple of things here. First of all, when you have a problem, take it before the Lord. Realize that your problem is his problem because he loves you. And then, are you living for the glory of the Lord with your problem? And one of the great miracles is that 185,000 Assyrian soldiers did not wake up in the morning. Okay? So imagine that. You come and uh, God decides, I'm going to kill 185,000 of you. And everybody went home and the king's children killed him. And that was the end of that king. And that was the end of that experience. And I just find this to be one of the great moments in biblical history where God's protection is so incredible. Okay, realize that if the Assyrians took over Jerusalem, there would be no Jews, there would be no Christians, there would be no Muslims. Okay, that was a big moment in the life of the story of Jesus Christ and the history of God's people. And it all happened because the king asked God for mercy. I want you to feel how it works out. And, and, you know, God's power in our nation is something that, that has it's been noted. You know, during the Gettysburg War, um, it's kind of powerful to realize that General Lee and the Confederates were winning the battle, okay? And the North had two-thirds more casualties, but the North won the battle. And when you do a little study and you realize there was some divine intervention, and this was a turning point in the Civil War. Um, you have to know that in the nation, 
when it reaches out to God. Remember when we had a, a astronaut getting off course and the president asked us to pray and all of a sudden, miraculously, the, uh, the Apollo got back on course. It was miraculous. It wasn't supposed to happen. What happened? The nation prayed. The nation prays. Things happen. Okay? And, and the Lord takes care of the nations. I think it's interesting that He cares about the heathen nations. He cares about the enemy nations of Israel. It's always baffling to me. He fights against them, but then cares about them. He's God. He's big. It's like we talked about a week or so ago, last week, when Joshua sees Jesus and he says, are you for us or against us? And he says, neither. <laughs> okay, I'm not against humanity, but I am going to be fighting for you. Okay. So it's like Abraham Lincoln said, I'm not so worried about whether God's on our side. I'm worried, am I on his side? Okay. And, and so God is the God of the world, the nations, the earth, but he's also a very personal God. Hezekiah becomes ill to the point of death. And Isaiah, the prophet, comes and says, get your house in order. You are going to die. You will not recover. Okay. Okay. It's a cheery, no, cheery amount of news to get, right? Um, could you imagine your, your prophet is Isaiah? <laughs> I just think that's just so incredible. That's his personal prophet. He's got Isaiah being the one bringing the word of God to him. And it's not a very good word. Put your house in order. You're going to die. You will not recover. And so what's he doing? He's doing his best to avoid the inevitable foe called death. Is this not what we're all hoping not to encounter? Put off for as long as possible? Death. Um, but guess what, friends? I, I looked up in the um, American Institute of, of, of Medicine, and right now the death rate still is at 100%. Wow. Okay? Everybody's going to die. All right? <laughs> it's, uh, I had to look it up. Okay, so, uh, okay. Um, what's well, been said, time and tides wait for no man, or as Andy Rooney shared, life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. Okay, I don't know if you want to go with literature or, uh, you know, or the common man's opinion, but what I'm telling you is it's coming. You can go to the gym, you can eat your, your diet with you know, no sugar, fats, or it's still going to come and get you, all right? Um, so here's the deal. Imagine you were going to get this news. What would you do? I mean, it's kind of heavy news, especially when it comes from God, all right? Yeah, you know, he knows things, right? I mean, if ever there's a time to play, it's when to pray, it's when you get this message. And, and have you ever noticed that it's not until you have an urgency that you go to prayer? Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. You know, it's better if you just live there. Because then, you, you know, he wouldn't have to send Isaiah. He could just say, hey, guess what? You're coming home with me. Okay. He could have had an Enoch experience. He could have been in prayer and the Lord would say, hey, you know, why don't you come home with me instead of going home to your, uh, your kingdom? And boom, um, it would have happened. So, he gets upset. He turns his face to the wall and wept bitterly. Okay? And, and he does something. He points out, God, do you realize how faithful I've been to you? And he asks for mercy. And, and so... As Isaiah comes, gives the bad news, and he's on his way back to wherever Isaiah was going, um, what is Hezekiah doing? Does he say, I need a second opinion? Can you call the doctor? Can I have the royal medicine come and, and give me a look over? Um, he immediately talks to God. Yep. He asked for an extension. <laughs> this is like the IRS right here, okay? <laughs> he knows who the source of life is. 
And sometimes we think the source of life is the doctors, the source of life is, you know, the banker, the source of life is somebody. It is the Lord God. <coughs> and, and sadly, we do go to medicine, therapists, doctors, counselors. But I want you to hear me. Therapy of any kind does not replace theology, the study of God, the experience of God. An encounter with God always trumps whatever other form of wisdom you're going to get. Okay? Um, I did say on Sunday, patients who are prayed over have a better recovery rate. Okay? Um, you know, if I was Hezekiah, I would have said, Hey, Isaiah, come here, before you leave. Okay? Pray for me right now. You know, when you have the most radical prophet as your personal prophet, you know, I would say, Come on, hey, I order you as the king to come here. Okay? But um, here's the deal. Psalm 103. God who heals all your diseases and saves your life from the pit. This is the God that Hezekiah turns his face to the wall and talks to. You said Psalm 103? Psalm 103. And, and I think sometimes Christians need to act, quit acting like humanists. You know, and realize that our source is God and he has the ultimate power. Um, Jesus is the source of life, the author and finisher of your faith, the one who in the beginning created the worlds according to John chapter 1. All right? And, and as I said on Sunday, he's, uh, Exodus 15, the Lord says, I am your healer. So if you have a problem, you go to him. And it's not just for your physical healings. As I talked about on Sunday, sometimes the Lord's, well, you know, deal with your bad hip. Deal with your situation. Because I want to use that for you to turn to me. I am, one thing he's not doing is punishing you. How's that? If you have an affliction, it's not punishment. Not waking you up. He's, but he is saying, let's live close to me. Yeah. You know what, in this world you will have tribulations. Deal, you stay close to me, I'll get you through this, you know. Whatever it's going to be. I don't know what his line is. But I do know this. If you don't ask for a prayer for a healing, you're probably not going to get it. Hezekiah, Second Chronicles 16. Excuse me. King Asa, Second Chronicles. Great king. Had radical victories. Did wonderful works for the kingdom of God. But as he got older, um, I don't know if health and wealth got to him, but he had a foot problem and he went to the doctors instead of the Lord. Okay, I want to make a big deal out of this. Go to the Lord. And, and, and I'm not saying that we don't forego a visit to the doctors. All right? God does use medicine. But um, prayer and medicine, that is a great combination. Because medicine might go so far where the Lord can take it further. And, and, you know, a lot of folks say, well, I don't go to the doctors. I have faith. Okay, I know people like this. Sadly, this one guy had a kid, and he had faith, and he wasn't going to go to the doctor because that would indicate that he didn't have faith. And so the kid dies, and so they were, took him to court, and he was a uh, manslaughter slash murder verdict against him. And so the judge sentenced him to a year of doing rounds following a doctor at a hospital to see that medicine actually is a good thing. Okay? Well, what do we know? Hezekiah has learned how to depend on the Lord when there's an incredible military disaster on his doorsteps. Now what is he doing? He's got a physical problem and he's going to the Lord as this health disaster is on his doorsteps. And, and I want to talk about healing a moment here because the Bible speaks about healing all the time. And I just want to remind you, you're invited to ask for healing. You're in, invited to pray over others for their healing. I remember one time I was listening to a couple of pastors talk and they said, well, there's about a 2% chance that people get healed. You know, and I, I was thinking, wow, 2%. You guys are low percentage prayers, you know? <laughs> 
And, and you know, it's, it's not so much that I was judging them as much as they were talking about it in a very um, scientific perspective. They, they didn't bring in the personality of God, the nature of God, the power of God, the spirit of God. They were just looking at what they considered to be the statistics. And, and you're invited to ask for healing. He, Hebrews, excuse me, 2 Timothy 4.20. Trophimus, I left sick in Miletus. And you're going, wait a minute. If he's traveling with Paul and he's sick, why doesn't Paul just go, oh, hey, let me heal you? But he doesn't. Kind of shocked me. I'm like, well, I mean, don't you think if you're hanging out with the Apostle Paul, you're going to get healed, right? I mean, you're going to get rocks thrown at you and take beatings too, but you're all going to get healing. But he doesn't. And, and, and this is one of Paul's ministry companions. And, and did Paul not have enough faith? Or is it because sometimes we get sick? All right. Again, 100% death rate. I think of Elisha, the guy that does all the radical miracles. I think he died of cancer. Couldn't heal himself. All right. It comes a moment when it's your time to go. Um, why do Christians get sick? And I have so many people who say, well, I plan on living until I'm 120 years old. Okay. It's in the Bible. You're one of them. Okay? And here's the problem. My mom's always telling me, oh, I'm going to live till I'm 120. And I say, well, what happens to my inheritance? You're going to use it all. Okay. And, 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 you know, we live in an imperfect world. Satan attacks us. We make poor, you know, choices. We get difficult spiritual assignments. You know, I don't know what it's going to be. But we want to live as long as we can with and for and to the glory of God. Amen. That's how you want to live. That's the way you go. And, you know, let's get down in the meat and potatoes of this healing stuff. In James 5, it says, is anyone suffering? Pray. Okay. And all of us, we, we have a burden that we carry. Maybe it's an addiction, a personal problem, an emotional issue, a depression, somebody. The, you know, all of us have some reason to pray for healing, emotionally, physically, relationally, spiritually. And I don't want you to miss your miracle by not asking. Now, have I not said this five times? Five times is because I want to get you in the habit of asking God to step into your situation. But here's what it says in James 5. When you're sick, pray and ask others to pray with you. And, and, and this is good. Bring in the elders of the church. You know, I had a guy that came to our church, really beautiful man, and he said, I want the elders, I've got a cancer diagnosis, and I want the elders to pray over me. I'm like, okay, we'll pray. So we set the time, and we got all the elders there, and then I met with him, and he goes, okay, now, I have some questions to ask the elders before they pray over me. And I said, okay, hold on a minute. You don't get to interview the elders and discern whether they're worthy or not to pray over you. You're taking control of what is God's word and God's invitation. Okay? So you can see sometimes how we want to be in charge of our spiritual journey. And there are moments when we just hand it over to him. We ask the elders to come in. And you know what? We're going to just let the elders do their thing. Intercessory prayer, okay? This is when you pray on God's behalf, someone else's behalf. And, and do you know yourself to be an intercessor? I'm going to ask because this is an important piece. On your prayer list, are you someone with people that you pray for regularly? You know, I pray for my kids. I pray for my mother-in-law, okay? I pray for um, my congregation, I pray for my close friends, but then we got some other people on the list, you know, people that aren't doing so well, people that I don't like, people that annoy me, okay, because I know I'm on a lot of their lists too, you know, I'm in the annoyance category on a lot of people's lists. And what I'm trying to say is when Jesus says pray for your enemies, if you have someone that you're at odds with, instead of being at odds with them, put them on your prayer list and let the grace you receive 
be extended to them. The folks that you're annoyed with, maybe you're the annoying factor without realizing it. And this is where in prayer, God will reveal to you, actually you have the problem, William, not that person. I was hoping to bring your spiritual maturity to this situation, William. And you're like, wow, I missed the chance to get it right. And you figure that out when you're in prayer. Okay? And, and, and realize when you're praying, you're asking for the nature of God to show up. And what is the nature of God? To forgive, to show grace, to extend compassion. So do you see what happens when you go to prayer and ask God to speak to you and through you? Well, here's the hard part in James 5.16. It says, if someone is sick, um, ask them to request forgiveness and then they will be healed. And if you ever want to get somebody mad at you when they're sick and they ask you to pray over them, say, okay, I need you to ask for the forgiveness of your sins. Because the implication is you did something wrong that you need to ask forgiveness for. And therefore, if you get this out of the way, God will heal you. Sounds like what the Bible says. However, there's a flaw with that statement, isn't there? Did you do something to get cancer? I don't know if you did or not. Probably, you know, you worried and put into motion and worries a sin in the saints, uh, the sins of the saints book. So I guess you could apply that. Yeah. And I'm, what I'm trying to do here is, is mess around with, you know, did you do something wrong? Maybe yes, probably not. God doesn't punish us. Punishment was taken to the cross by Jesus Christ. Sometimes things happen in life. Maybe we mismanaged our emotions. Maybe nothing happened at all. You were the recipient of a bad situation. So why would I ask them to ask forgiveness? Maybe asking forgiveness is a moment of submission to the Lord. Maybe it's this place where you clear the slate. Maybe it's when you say, Lord, I am someone who's dependent upon your mercy and your grace. It's not so much, what sin did you do that you need to ask forgiveness for? As much as, ah, Lord, here I am in need of a touch from you. And so, guess what? Forgiveness clears the air. It removes and addresses hidden issues within our souls. If you're reluctant to go there, I think you have a problem. Okay? So don't be so reluctant to just say, let me... Let me take a peek at my soul and see what's going on in here. Let me clear the air. It's not a tit for tat. It's, I want to make sure that everything's good between me and God. Remember, Hezekiah asked for mercy, and that's what he got. All right. Listen to this. Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your sight. That was his request. Now, I'm just going to suggest that when you get to the pearly gates, that you don't walk in with your resume of accomplishments, say, now, Lord, do I need to point out a few things here? How faithful I've been. Okay, because Isaiah 64, 6 says, even our good deeds are filthy rags before the Lord. All right? Isaiah what? 64, 6. Thank you. Um, you know, Hezekiah, he's assuming that because he was a righteous king, he's going to get mercy. But actually, what he did was he asked for mercy. And the Lord saw the first part of his request and ignored the second part of the justification of it. Praise be to God that he knows the heart and um, supplements for our weaknesses. Okay, God shows mercy to Hezekiah because he asked for it. His good deeds, I doubt they had very much to do with it. Okay, and, and, and again, remember that place in Matthew 7 where it says, Did we not do this and did we not do that and you know, cast out demons and do many miracles? And the Lord says, I never knew you'd depart from me. What does he say? I never knew you. You who practice lawlessness. Well, wait a minute. Casting out demons and, and doing the miraculous and 
That's not lawlessness. If the Spirit of God is not your motivating, empowering force, guess what? It's not counted for you. So what I'm saying is it's in the relationship you have with Jesus Christ that all the power and all the effectiveness and everything that makes us Christian, this is where our source is. We get into heaven because of what Jesus did for us. It's a free gift. You don't earn it. You just respond to it. And the best way to respond is to believe that God loves you. Believe He wants to move through you. Believe that He's called you to release His authority to cast out demons and heal people and proclaim the gospel and be with Him. And you're, you're in the right spot. Okay? And sometimes... God answers the prayers of people that I would not think that he would answer the prayers of. You know, we had the Pulse shooting a few years ago, right? It was five years ago. And I heard a story that there was a bunch of drag queens in the, the Pulse nightclub, and they heard the shooting, and they went into the back room, and they closed the door, and they got into a circle, and they held hands and prayed to be delivered, and all of a sudden, an air conditioning duct gets removed and all of them get out safely. And you're like, wow. Well, you mean God cares about drag queens? I mean, you know, if I was put in a list of people that God would answer the prayers of, you know, drag queens might be lower on the list than upper on the list, right? I don't know. He loves everyone. He loves everyone, and he especially has a fondness for the sinner. Women don't know they're sinning. And, and we need to have our hearts aligned with his heart that has a fondness for the sinner. And it doesn't matter if you're a drag queen kind of sinner or the church gossiper or, okay, Anybody in between. The worst sin is I don't have any sin. You think I'm above everybody else. No, you might need some forgiveness, but being a Lord, you know, we got, uh, you know, we're, no. You know, that's the guy who's at the bottom of the, the list. Yeah. yeah, right. All have fallen short. And, and Hezekiah seems to know that the Lord is merciful. And this is what got his attention. And I like him. He doesn't go pick out a coffin. He doesn't make funeral arrangements. He doesn't write his will. Okay? Okay? He says, Lord, have mercy. And mercy, my friend, is God's specialty. And I just want you to hear that. Mercy is God's specialty. Isn't that beautiful? Notice he prayed immediately. A lot of times I'll have a problem like, oh boy, I got to work this thing over. You know, and I, I got to get to this. And I put up, I'll get a list and I'll get all, you know, my ducks in a row. And no, you got a problem, you turn to the Lord. You immediately enter into his presence. Okay, that's the best move you can make. And I just want you to know, your relationship can, God, can cause God to move on your behalf. Very important. Remember on Sunday I said, in the name of Jesus is where the power comes from, but it's in the relationship with the name of Jesus that actually is the power. Right? And, and you know, he turned to the wall, and the wall is representative of a barrier or an obstacle. And to be honest, too often we have walls and obstacles in our lives that are just too big for us to, to, de to deal with, okay? Um, and... and the only way to get through the law, the wall, excuse me. Here, I, I put something on Facebook where it says, no matter the problem, take it to the Lord. And, and it was kind of a statement like, no matter if you caused it or they caused it. No matter if it's a physical, an emotional, a spiritual problem, whatever the problem, take it to the Lord. And suddenly you feel empowered. So whatever the problem... He says, bring it to me. And you bring it to him, you drop it in front of him, 
and he wants to bless you. You know, this one man was hired to, to paint the center line down the middle of the highway, and the first day he painted three miles, and the second day he, he painted two miles, and the third day he painted one mile, and the boss says, what's going on? The first day you painted three miles, and now it's been... He goes, well, you know, the can's all the way back there, and I have to... Okay. And, and we do that. We, we, we allow there to be distance between us and God. Okay? When He comes alongside of us, and everywhere we go, He's our source that we reach into to extend mercy, to receive mercy. Okay? And, and so I, I want you to feel that. And I love the way God handles it. You know, Isaiah, he's walking out, and before he even gets out of the courtyard, God says, turn around. Go tell Hezekiah, I, I, I heard his prayers, and I've seen his tears, and I'm going to add 15 years to his life. And 15 is kind of a cool number because um, 7 is the number of completion and end, and 8 is the number of new beginnings. So you've come to the end, and I'm giving you a new beginning, and... Altogether, that's 15 years. So, I remember when I turned 50, and you know, you're supposed to retire at 65, right? And so, I'm like, oh my gosh, I only have 15 years left. You know, it was a, it was a trauma for me. So you can imagine how bad it was a couple months ago when I turned 60. You know, oh my gosh, I'm gonna go to the legacy group. <laughs> Not as the speaker. Remember what your mother said. Yeah. 120. 120. So. Oh my goodness. You know, I don't know. What would you do if, if God came to you and said, get your affairs in order? So, you, go, you get to go see Jesus. You know, I want to point to Judy's dad. He, you know, when he died and the will was read, he, uh, he, had, he had the lawyer share his testimony to his children. Before they got the money, they had to listen to the gospel. Okay? That, so that was already in place. He had his spiritual affairs in order. So that's something to think about. And, you know, there's always a debate. Do you want to go immediately or do you want to die, you know, after a seven-month cancer battle? And you're like, oh, I don't want to go through a cancer battle. But that means no goodbyes. It's immediate. Things left unsaid. Forgiveness not extended. Yeah. Suddenly you're like, wow, you know. Would you like to have those last moments to look in somebody's eyes? Or do you spend your life looking into their eyes and saying the right things and releasing the love of God so you're ready to go? Sooner or later, it doesn't matter whether we live or die, we go with the Lord. You know, I always think about what I'd say to my kids. You know, I'd say to my son, you know, take care of the poor, eat your vegetables. You know, read the Bible. I'd say to my daughter, clean your room. Okay? I know somehow they become when they become moms, it stops, okay? So I know what I would say to my congregation. I would say, be biblically based, Christ centered, grace oriented. Spirit-led. That's what I think is what it means to be a Christian. And that's what I want for you and for me. You know, we're talking about the end of days, and this old man was on his deathbed, and, you know, his wife's preparing for his, you know, funeral, even though he hasn't died yet, and she's making cookies for the funeral. <laughs> huh. So he smells the aroma, and he's like, oh, my gosh, my wife's my favorite cookies, and he musters up all of his energy, and he grabs the, the walker, and he makes his way into the kitchen, and there are the cookies, and right when he reaches for one, a spatula smacks his hand and says, those are for the funeral. Okay. Yes. Yes. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, 
So be careful who you get married to, all right? His name was Frank. So I want you to know prayer is our first move. It's not our last resort. Very important. It's our first move. It's not our last resort. Okay? And Satan doesn't want you to pray because prayer moves the hand of God. Prayer touches the heart of God. Prayer, Jesus says, I will answer six different times in the New Testament. It's hard work. I say, read a chapter a day, and I want you to have the Bible. But, you know, you get your Bible out, you get your pen in your hand, and you underline anything that you might feel like the Lord's telling you. Okay? Now, but you're going to go to prayer, whole different matter. Now you're going into the presence of God, now you're going to have a conversation with God. The conversation is when you speak and then you allow him to speak. It's when, you know, you, you might write out some people that he puts on your mind. I have to write it out because I turned 60. Okay. Yeah. And you know, you have senior moment, I have senior pastor moments. Okay. I got to write things down. And, um, you know, it's a lot of fun to be able to go back to a prayer that you did three or four days ago because you know you felt it was anointed and you come back to it and you pull it forward. Okay. But it takes time to pray. But prayer is where all the presence and the power and the Spirit of God circulate in and around you. Okay. And, and, and I'm going to point out one haunting verse about Hezekiah. It says, the Lord withdrew from Hezekiah to see what was truly in his heart. What verse is that? The, um, I think it's 2 Chronicles 32, 32. Thank you. And he withdrew. And I think, oh my gosh, I don't want that. Because I know what's in my heart. The only thing that's good in my heart is because the Lord's spirit dwells within me. But I think what's happening is here, he's going, okay, Hezekiah. I've given you 15 extra years. I've blessed you. You've been a good king. You've followed me. You've believed in me. You've leaned on me. You've asked for my mercy. And to be honest, like so many other people, Hezekiah doesn't end well. Uh, another threat comes. He makes an alliance with the Babylonians, shows them all of the treasures of the Lord's house. You know, and wouldn't you know the prophet's... <laughs> The Lord has him right there. As soon as he says goodbye to the Babylonians, the, the prophet shows up. So, what would you just have a conversation about? Because the, the Lord wants to have a conversation with you. You shouldn't have shown him all this stuff. And because you've relied on the Babylonians to protect you from the Assyrians, instead of me, which, by the way, did I not kill 185,000 of them to protect you? No. Now you're going to have problems. Good. Yep, you messed up. And it's going to be a bad thing for your kids. And Hezekiah, well, it's okay with me. It's too bad for my kids. <laughs> you know, it's, it, we all have those stupid moments. We all have those selfish moments. We all have those prideful moments. We have those mismanaged moments. What do you do with them? Lord, I just had a prideful, selfish mm -hmm. moment. A mismanaged situation, you'd bring it right before him. He's the source of mercy and grace. He's the one. You know, King Ahab, God says, I'm going to give it to him. He's going to get the worst of me. And he's got a whole pronouncement of, of negativity against him. And Ahab puts on sackcloth and turns his face to the wall. And, and God says to Elijah, You see how Ahab, you know, humbled himself? I'm going to put it on his children instead of him. So do you see the heart of God, the mercy of God that's available to you, even when you mess up, even when you're in the wrong? Okay. Well, one thing about Hezekiah, he goes, oh, it's okay with me? Well, too bad for my kids. I would like to suggest that that's not the right way to think. I would like to suggest that we should care about the generation coming after us. We should invest our lives in the generation coming after us. We should care about the generation coming after us. And I don't mean necessarily just our kids and grandkids, but the people around us, okay? 
maybe we should be getting involved in you know political issues that move against the word of God. Maybe we should be getting involved in social issues like the Community Hope Center and Embrace. Maybe we should be mentoring the little kid down the street that shows up at your alleyway garage door. All my life, I've had kids at the garage door of my alley. And all my life, I get to mentor and have a relationship with and, and it's just a beautiful way to live, thinking in terms of how can I be a blessing to somebody else? Well, <clears throat> how much time do we have? I've been going on too long here. You know, there's a really cool moment when um, Hezekiah, he should just say thank you, right? But he says, how do I know? Yeah. And, and so he says, all right. Let me give you a, let me, let me, uh, what, what do you want to see? He goes, how about if the shadow goes forward 10 steps? He goes, anybody could do that. How about if it goes backward 10 steps? He goes, all right, let it be. Think about this. For that to happen, the earth's rotation would stop and turn backwards. Tides would be affected. Okay. Wait, what? The, the world would be turning backwards on its axis, and there would be lots of ramifications, okay? Um, but I want you to hear something. When it came to you and me having a problem with sin, okay, God turned the world on its axis to step in and remove the cosmic problem that you and I had with sin. He stepped in, the Lord God, creator of all things, to say, you matter to me. I'm removing this sin. And you know what? I guess what I'm saying is you're praying to a God who can do the miraculous and proved it with a love more incredible than any story on earth. What do they say? The greatest story ever told? God who came and found you who made the mistake and said, I'll take the ramifications so that you get to live forever blessed with me. Amen. 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 In today's fast-moving world, smartphones are integrated into our lives. We bank and shop on our smartphones, and many of us want to give with them too. Giving to the church with a text message is fast, easy, and versatile. With Give Plus Text, you can make a weekly offering or respond to a special appeal in just seconds. To give, you enter the church's 10-digit Give Plus Text number and the amount you wish to donate. Then, send your text. The first time you contribute with Give Plus Text, you'll receive a secure registration link. Click the link to go to our secure website where you'll enter your contact and payment information. Tap Process when you're done. After you've completed your registration, a text reply will verify that your gift has been received. We'll also email you a receipt. For future giving, you simply send a text with the amount you wish to give, and it will process automatically. You can also choose to make your gift recurring. Give Plus Text is that easy. Register, give, repeat. Call or visit the church office to ask about Give Plus Text and the other electronic giving options we offer.